Well, hello. <laughs> Thanks for having me out. Um, it's kind of become an annual thing. It's always a pleasure on my end of it, at least. And like we were saying earlier, you just never know if it's going to be snowing, raining, <laughs> sunny. I don't know. It doesn't, you can't hardly beat this. I wonder if we would have had some more people here tonight if it wasn't quite so nice. I don't know. I was out feeding bees before coming in here, and I'll say it's kind of hard to, hard to quit that in the middle of a nice sunny day because, man, it's just been a while. Were you guys out in your bee yards during that eclipse yesterday? I got to one just afterwards, and it was oddly still. And about a half hour, that I got there just short after 2 o'clock. I was trying to get there before, and uh, I stopped at Casey's with a welding helmet to <laughs> stare at the sun for a minute because um, I couldn't quite get out there. And then uh, I got out there, and it's real still, and I just thought, man, that's odd. And I didn't even make the association at first that maybe it's because the sun was gone and it's probably just the light or whatever, but it was really crazy. This was a big yard, it was a holding yard, so there was uh, probably not quite 400 hives in there. And so when they started to get active again, it was a sight to behold. It was so windy that the, the flight was just amazing and intense right around the hives. But if you went, I don't know, 10 yards away or 15 yards away, there was hardly a bee that could venture that far away because the wind was holding them home. But man, they were thick in the air. But when I first got there, it was just crazy. And when I finally, with my slow brain piece set together, that that was uh, an eclipse is pretty neat. All right. Um, let's, talk, uh, let's talk bees through time, beekeeping through time as years go by. I gave this talk at the Central Iowa meeting and Richard asked me if I could give it again. I said, oh yeah, of course, that's super easy. I didn't have to put any new slides together. All right. Always learning and always changing is I, I think probably something that all, we all can relate to. You're always trying something new, whether it's new equipment, see how you like it or different mic control strategies or whatever. So I thought I'd hit a few points. Um, so often working for the state, um, I'm talking about other people's bees and what I'm seeing across the state of Iowa and health and disease issues and seasonal conditions and things like that. And since this talk is from that central Iowa winter meeting, which was a great meeting, um, if you didn't go to that one, you should go to next year's. I would encourage you just every year. It's a great one. Um, Jamie, uh, who comes to this meeting sometimes, Jamie Byer asked me to give this talk and he said, could we have you talk about yourself for a change. <laughs> and I said, if you want to hear it, I don't know. I, I guess I'll, I'll ramble on about that instead. So I guess I'll start as introducing myself as an overblown hobbyist. I started uh, in Kentucky a little over 20 years ago with a couple hives of bees. And I was um, looking into forestry as a career at that point in time. And it was, uh, it was around that time that forestry jobs were just slashed. <laughs> And I just thought, man, I'm going to be entering into a job market along with a third of the foresters, federal foresters, had lost their jobs uh, the year before. And I thought, I'm never going to have a job. <laughs> but I was starting it with bees, and I had taken some classes on forest insects and forest entomology and things like that. I've always been kind of a bug nerd ever since I was a kid. Um, that never changes. I think if it's in you, it's in you. I think Riley can relate to that. I'll put him on the spot. He's always taking pictures and anything nature, anything outdoors, right? Um, and, and I think that's probably something a lot of us share. And so those two hives just became more hives over the year. And that basically is the story, right? It's like either you're a hobbyist and you just want to stay at that level and you want to maybe spend more money on your bees than you make on them. That's the definition of a hobby. Um, or else if you stick with it, you end up with more and more hives and the potential is there, the pressure's on at some point, you better start making money to justify all of the expense that you're shelling out. And, um, and, and that's me. So, you know, it starts with maybe a focus on whatever, you have a garden and you want more pollinators or you just wanna make some honey, uh, whatever the issue is. And then over time, especially if you're trying to make a few dollars off this, make it pay for itself and then eventually make an income stream. Maybe you get into bottling and marketing your honey a little better. Maybe now you're starting to make beeswax products. Maybe now you're getting paid to pollinate. Um, maybe you're selling bees and the list goes on through time, but the beekeeping is still the same. You just got your head in a beehive. Even when it's not literally in the beehive, your head's still in the beehive, if you know what I'm saying. I think we all share that. All right. So some things never change. <laughs> all right. Um, as numbers go up, I think we're all doing the same thing, essentially, right? Whether you got two hives in your backyard, 
or whether you got a whole bunch of yards, whether you got hundreds and hundreds of hives like Riley does or thousands of hives like some other beekeepers have, it, the efficiencies of it, I think, become more um, critical, right? You need to manage that yard level. I've had 300 hives of bees yesterday and I did it in 270 minutes. That's 50 something seconds per hive, less than a minute per hive, feed and treat and get out of there, right? That's not rinky dinking around and stepping back and enjoying the flight <laughs> and looking at all the brood frames and trying to find a queen or whatever. That's in, out, in, out, in, out, in, out, in, out as fast as I could because I was trying to get home at the end of the day after working uh, even prior to that. So managing at the yard level might mean you just gotta load up the truck with everything you, you probably need, right? At, at least that you imagine you'll need. There's always something you forget. And then you hit that yard and you're not gonna spend all day going through a few hives. Instead, you're gonna compare one hive to the rest of the crowd there. Is this hive keeping pace? No, for whatever reason, the other three hives on this pallet or in the row are all making honey and they need another box. But this one, for some reason, is floundering and there's hardly any bees when I open it up. It's quiet and they're not up in their honey supers. That's the one then you had to dive into it and try to figure out what's going on in there. Um, equalizing everything on a yard level or an operation level, whether it is five hives in your backyard or whatever, or whether it's hundreds of hives that you're trying to get through, I think is a critical practice, right? Because it keeps everything on the same pace so that you don't have two hives that are really just going gangbusters and then two hives over here that are just sitting there lackluster. As a hobbyist, you can do that and you're not so worried about throwing away money, but it's these two hives. It's always the hives that aren't making any money that are causing you the problems and sucking away your time and your money and inputs trying to fix those, right? So you gotta just equalize everything up to a similar kind of scale, similar strength, similar health, and then set them free and try to keep that equality through the season. And it never quite works out that way, right? There's always kind of one nice day per year where more or less everything in the yard, double deeps, a couple supers on it. And then the next time after I put those fresh supers on it, they start to look like this, you know, like a city scape kind of thing. Some hives get tall, other hives stay in their, their brood boxes. And even in this picture, you can see that, right? What's going on with that hive right there, kind of in the center of the photo where it doesn't even have a super on it. You know, there's always that issue. Maybe it's swarmed, who knows what, I, I don't remember. Um, but it's that hive there that isn't gonna make me any money and it's gonna cost me the time that it takes to go through there and try to problem solve. Where if they're all doing good, maybe it's just as simple as pulling that top box off, looking in there, hey, you're making honey, I'll throw another super on. That doesn't even take 54 seconds or whatever, that takes 10 seconds and then on to the next hive. All right. One issue there is fixing issues before you leave the yard. I go to a lot of hobbyist places um, and a, one of the big contrasting things between a hobbyist and a larger scale beekeeper oftentimes is that a larger scale beekeeper has just had that lesson beaten into their head. You gotta fix the issues before you get in the truck and leave, right? And I'm guilty of this in my, if you call it an operation, I, I have a couple hundred, 250, 260 highs of bees at the peak of the year um, and, and that's it, which both sounds like a lot and also I realize it isn't a lot at all, not even remotely close to being a lot. I'm that in-betweener. But um, who here has bricks or rocks or something in their bee yard? And if you have an issue in a hive, you put a brick on top of it or something like that, and then you come back. I do that too. <laughs> and sometimes that's exactly the thing to do, right? Say you did lose that swarm and you realize it. You found open queen cells in there. Put a brick on there, and then you know I'm going to dive down into that hive in a week, 10 days. Next time I'm in this yard, I'm going to see if I see eggs, right? That's a great mental note. You don't even have to take notes. But say that's a dead out, and you think, well, I'll just put a brick on it, and then I'll come back. It's better to pick up those boxes, take them with you, store them properly, avoid a mouse moving in or wax uh, moss or small hive beetles robbing things out and sliming things. If you've got a weaker hive, maybe that had swarmed or had a queen issue and now it's fixed, but it's behind the eight ball compared to the other hives in your yard, maybe you could take brood frames, making sure you're not moving the queen from a stronger one and fix that issue again before you leave instead of letting it flounder, trying to still get its wheels underneath it. Uh, while the rest are making honey, those kind of things. Sometimes you get in a hurry and you lose focus of fixing everything before you leave and go on to the next, right? Whether it's a hive to hive or a yard to yard kind of thing. All right. Um, 
Yard size, that's something that's changed a lot. Learn some, change some. You'll notice a loop, <laughs> uh, kind of a, a circle uh, that I've gone through in a, lot, a whole lot of these slides here. Um, and, and I'm purposely pointing that out to you. It, you know, oftentimes you'll start off small, grow and get bigger, realize that ain't for you, and then you scale it back a little bit. And that's me on yard size. Um, you, everybody tends to start out with a couple few hives in their backyard. And then maybe they add more spaces or maybe they scale up, you know, this yard could hold 10, 12. I get that question a lot. How many hives do you think this location could hold? It's like, <laughs> I have no idea. Um, I've got yards with 60 hives in them. We were talking earlier about, you know, Spring Valley and just how impressed I am with the way they manage their bees in a lot of ways. And he's got yards sometimes with well over 100 hives in them. And uh, nature can hold that. You know, Iowa is, uh, we're in a sweet spot here, I think. When we're in a good, diverse spot, if you got a little river flowing nearby, it seems to be a good corridor for them. If you've got some diversity, if you've got some good prairie, but also some good weeds, right? Clovers and things like this around you. Uh, maybe some tree flow. Um, it's amazing how many hives you can put in a little location. And as those bees go out and fly, they can bring it back without any competition or so it seems between themselves. But there's a limiting factor to that. So I've pushed that in a couple areas. Over in Dallas Center, you know, kind of west, maybe northwest of Des Moines, I've got a couple huge yards. They're towards the Raccoon River. And the locations are just beautiful. And it just seems like I can't put enough bees in there to where I'm gonna notice any competition to where they're kind of arguing with each other, competing for honey or whatever. It doesn't seem to slow them down. The thing that slows it down for me is pulling that honey <laughs> at the end of the year. And you know, if you're in a dearth, you know, you, if you've crossed that line between when the weather's good and the bees are happy and flying and there's nectar coming in and all of a sudden, it's like that switch flips around September 1st a lot of times. And now, the day isn't as warm as it was a week ago, and there's you see some goldenrod, but it looks a little dry. You know, the bees aren't getting so much fall flow, and you're still out there pulling honey as fast as you can, and now you got 60 or more hives in that yard. By the time you finish, much before that even, you've got a problem on your hands, right? Those bees are robbing, and I always kind of hear Fastbinder in my head. He said this years ago, and I'm gonna butcher it, but basically he said three stages of robbing, and you wanna avoid them all, of course ideally, <laughs> um, but he'll say uh, the first stage of robbing is where the bees are happy and excited about getting this other food source. Second stage of robbing is when they're fighting each other over that food source, tangling up, twisting around each other, stinging each other to death, and they get a little moody around that time. The third stage of robbing is when they're coming after you. <laughs> and time and again with these bigger yards by myself, by the time you get that honey crop pulled in off all those hives and on your truck and trying to ram out of there, you're getting eaten up. The bees are mad, they're stinging each other, they're robbing, you got a cloud of bees in the air, a cloud of bees on your truck, they're diving down into the boxes that you're trying to get for yourself, and that can be a limiting factor. And so that robbing last year was a real, real issue, at least for me, and I think for a lot of other beekeepers uh, around different areas of the state. When that honey flow was over last year, they got brutal against each other, and that was to an extreme measure. And a lot of hives went down, um, some of mine definitely uh, were part of this. I'm not talking about other people's beasts, and I'm talking about mine. I saw a lot of fighting and robbing going on. Once they start hitting a hive, especially when they're on pallets like this, it just seems like if they can take down one of those big tall ones with that cloud of robbers fighting each other and steal all that honey, then they just move next door a few inches away and they'll take that one down. And they just keep going through a yard. Sometimes it's really hard to get that stopped. Um, so my circular thinking is I started small, I got bigger thinking, oh, it's much more efficient this way and, and nature can provide for the bees and it's no problem. But then you realize maybe this isn't the best thing after all and you start to shrink those yards back down a little bit and maybe have a few more locations to set bees in fewer number per location. And that's kind of where my mentality is right now. All right, conditional wooden wear is another one of those where I came full circle, right? Everybody loves to start with brand new boxes. <laughs> and I started with brand new boxes. Uh, I drove over to Kelly's, Clarkson, Kentucky, got that stuff, painted them just so, drove back over there, got my first couple packages, set it all up. They're picture perfect, even named my two first queens. That's where it began and ended <laughs> with the naming. Um, and everything was just perfect, right? And I wanted wired wax foundation because I just thought, well, that's the coolest way to go or whatever. And now I complain about the amount of time it takes to take acorn 
you know, all in one plastic frames that have double wax on them. I complain about the amount of time it takes those out of the box to get them into the B boxes. <laughs> uh, I complain about everything. But I've gone from that, from wiring in and driving eyelets into, you know, frame in bars and all this kind of stuff just because I liked the way it looked and I, I liked what it did to, uh, I guess now I'm just a crotchety and old or something like that. But um, things change through time. Also, starting from those expensive first brand new hives, I decided if I'm going to grow my operation, I'm going to do it on like $2 boxes, right? And $2 boxes are the equivalent modern of about six or $8 boxes. Um, it just used to be $2 boxes, was very common. Used equipment, it's never that interested in getting somebody's old comb, but old boxes I bought up all day. I mean, anytime I could find a deal on used boxes that were in, and you should know, that beekeeper selling them for a reason. <laughs> this isn't up to their standard, and that's when I come along, bottom feeder, catfish of the beekeeping world, and those are for me, right? If it's got peeling lead paint on it, that's a deal. <laughs> And uh, so I build up, you know, on those. And I feel like I made gains through those years doing something a lot of beekeepers never do is making more money off my bees than what I was spending. That's the hard part about beekeeping, especially if you're trying to grow your operation. A lot of people have great bee operations, but I'm sure if you looked in their books, they never made a dollar, right? Because it's so expensive to get things cranked up. You feel like I'll just need this a few more hives, or I'm gonna buy some more bees, or I need a bigger piece of extraction equipment, or I need a truck, and I need a trailer, and I need a swinger, I need whatever, that never ends. <laughs> it's a constant treadmill of expansion and spending, and even though you're making more and more money, it just goes out the door even faster, right? And so this woodenware thing, cheap, loading by hand, um, you know, getting by for a long time, get to a point, then you start moving bees. You can have pretty crappy equipment if it's just sitting in your backyard or on somebody's property, but when you start to put that onto a truck and haul that and you're picking things up and torquing them with a forklift and getting bounced down 2,000 miles down the road from farm to farm or if you're moving for pollination, it's amazing how fast that beats up your equipment. And um, that's how, and let me say this, if it's a good picture of good strong bees in decent equipment, those are mine. If it's a bad picture, <laughs> That's somebody else's, and that's gonna be a recurring theme. Cause I just never, uh, not that I'm trying to hide anything. I'm, I mean, tonight is the night for me to tell stories on myself, but there's never really gonna come a day where I have an issue in front of me that needs fixing and I'm frustrated and then I take the time to pull out my cell phone and take a picture. But if I'm with somebody else, now it's funny and the cell phone's gonna come out. Not so funny when it's yourself, really hilarious when it's somebody else. This is our president of our Iowa Honey Producers Hives. This is Jason Foley. <laughs> and the reason why I do this is because if you were going to just see a box like that sitting on the back of a truck and you were a gambling person, it, it would be smart money to say that's my box and not his. He makes equipment. This is the exception to the rule. I don't know how that happened. He hurt his knee last year playing volleyball and uh, he needed help feeding and stuff like that, getting our bees ready in the fall to take to California. And so I was there helping him feed uh, one evening. And he blames this box on me because I am truly hard on equipment, but I am not that hard on equipment. Um, but this is, this is it. So it's just always that dynamic of new and expensive, but new, versus something that's already lived a life. And then you come in and you purchase that inexpensive um, relatively inexpensively, put good bees in it, run that as hard as you can, as long as you can, and then you end up with this. And so in my full circle here, um, a lot of my equipment looks maybe a hair nicer than that um, still, but I've come back to trying to infuse 100 or so boxes every year back into my operation. Keep calling it operation. It makes me sound like a bigger timer than what I actually am. Um, but that's, that's where I'm at on this. I feel like it's good money to put good money into equipment, but keep replacing a little every year until all of a sudden nothing is terribly old and terribly rotted out and terribly falling apart. Everything's just kind of so-so. That's a good place to be in. <laughs> all right. Here's another picture of that robbing I mentioned. The first picture is a holding yard in California a couple few years ago. 
Robin got kicked up there big time. There's a lot of bees in those yards. And uh, <laughs> what do you do? Well, we took these little pails, half drums, and just put corn syrup in it. And that's away from all these hundreds and hundreds of beehives that were there trying to at least divert it away as we went through. But man, when it gets started, it's a real issue. Um, having good food stores on your bees, keeping nothing but decent colonies, everything queen right, everything relatively equalized helps, goes a long way. Entrance reducers goes a long way. We've gotten away from that on pallets overall. And in minimizing the number of hives in the yard, that kind of thing, sometimes it's inevitable, but my God, is it almost just a crushing feeling when you just see the bees just going after each other. The second picture is Foley's truck. <laughs> um, this is basically, I don't know if it's that same day, but it's right around that same time last fall feeding. What we had here was, again, that honey flow last year just stopped. I mean, it just dropped like a rock uh, in, in Indianola, Des Moines area. And you had hives that were building up and making comb and storing honey. And then it just seemed like the next day we got these little kind of crappy little rains, not a lot of big downpours or whatever, but just these little drizzly rains day after day after day. And it just shut things down and um, late splits failed to thrive. You had a good box of bees. They never went up in the second one. If you're trying to pull out foundation there in July, going into August, they just didn't get it done for the most part. Maybe if you're a better beekeeper than I, um, or maybe just a more aware, or maybe it's just hindsight being 2020. If you had pulled whatever honey you had off of everything and just started feeding things, maybe you could have ended up with better hives at the end of the year than what we had. Jason has a, uh, um, like a walk-in freezer that he keeps. He's a queen breeder and he has lots of mini nukes full of comb and he stores that in frozen to keep his pests and things like that off of it preserve his combs a lot better. And so he had a lot of honeycombs and at least drawn wax that was sticky following extraction. We loaded those up on his truck and it took about three minutes before we kicked up a frenzy on there. So robbing again, just so extreme last year. All right. Knowing that you have yards and you know, here's my equipment again. You see a lot of holes, you see a lot of cracks, you see a lot of weak corners. You see a lot of lids, flat lids, just steel ply, like concrete uh, boards, form boards. There's what my lids are made out of on these. And you can see gaps, even that first one there on that top super, you've got two corners out of it and a lid that doesn't sit flat. That is a hive that potentially is in trouble. Now, most years is fine. Most months out of the year, it's fine. But then when that robbing stuff gets started, you got a real problem on your hands and fast. And that hive is in trouble. And things get exaggerated when you're coming through with a feeder rig and you're opening up several hives or when you're pulling honey, that kind of thing. Late in the year, if you're in a dearth like what we were last year, things can get kicked up in a hurry. All right. Uniformity of equipment. Hopefully this is heading in one direction and not something that's in a circle here. But I've gone from just never caring about, you know, a deep and a medium, a story and a half hive next to double deep, next to whatever. Um, I've toyed around with this and that. Uh, I, I've, I've never really cared much for like nicely painted boxes, all being the same color, that kind of stuff. This stuff grows on you and it's always good to see it in other people's, but for me, who cares? Um, I'm changing as, as years go by, I guess. Uh, I, I've done, uh, a lot of messing around over the years, especially before I started sending bees out to almonds, which is a large part of what this slide is. And it's totally fine. And I feel like I, I kind of miss it in a way, the creativity um, that comes with that chaos of having some hives that are in double, some hives that are a deep in a medium, some hives, like I say on there, that stack nukes, meaning I've got a split 10 frame box, a divider down the middle, special bottom board, one's going out the front and one's going out the back, a feeder and two frames in the bottom, then two more, two, uh, four frames, and then on that, and then two more four framers on top of that. So three stories, 10 frames in a one gallon feeder. I was running a lot of those. And I thought they were great because I could make those the end of June or the beginning of July and start them with the cell that I was grafting myself. Start that cell on and just in the bottom box on two frames, really nice warm summer. Get that immersed, get it mated, give them another box of comb, come up into that, draw that out, give them another box on top to make four, four and two, 10 frames, get each side hopefully in the perfect world through winter time. Now in basically one 
equivalent of a 20 frame, basically the equivalent of a double with these stacked nukes. I could take both of those in the spring, knock them out of the, the nukes into a flat box, right? So maybe I'd take the bottom two frames away because those are usually empty, your bees are usually upstairs, have eight frames in my feeder in a single. That buys me time in the early season, kind of delays that swarm urge, knocks them flat. I can add the second box on, fill that feeder, let them build up a little bit. And by the time they're ready to be split, the weather's a little bit more agreeable and I can get queen cells going again and I can make queens. I was doing all that kind of stuff, but it's pretty chaotic. And then I started sending bees to California and if you're gonna get on some commercial beekeepers load, you gotta match their equipment, right? It's gotta fit and stack with their stuff. So sooner or later, all of that went away. And now I'm just kind of this boring, double deep on a pallet kind of beekeeper. And there really is no going back for me. Um, back to doubles, right? Started with two deeps, you know, that kind of thing, those highs from Kelly, as I mentioned, moved away, got all kind of creative on it, had a lot of fun and then pollination happens. And when you're moving bees, little details start to matter. Things you might never even thought of. Um, the pallet, the cleat on the bottom of them. If one is made out of a one by four and the next one is made out of the thick decking, that little fraction of an inch is enough to get things off. Or if your lids, if you have some lids that have maybe a little spacer shim so you can throw a pollen patty or something underneath there, that little shim under there and the other ones are totally flat or even different thicknesses of plywood. That's all it takes when you're putting stuff on your truck and you're trying to throw a strap over it or whatever to get something wobbling or that box on there that's just loose and no matter how tight you pull that strap, you can't get things to sit flat. It doesn't take much. And so little details like that or the, the width of the pallet, like front, and then you got the gap, and then you got the hive behind it, 44 inches, 48 inches, little details like that start to add up for you. And you just think everything has to be uniform, lockstep uniform, and I'm still working towards that. I'm getting closer every year instead of farther from it. Still not pretty is the bottom line on that. All right, and this is why. This is out there, Riley knows this truck quite well. <laughs> this is uh, where we send our bees in California. Riley spent a lot of time in that cab. Big old truck, it gets strapped front to back. Four straps, one over each row of hives. It doesn't get the straps across ways, it's just front to back. And things gotta line up pretty good and the straps have to be squished pretty tight to cram all that together on there. And it just doesn't take a whole lot of wonkiness before things get sketchy. All right. Queens, again, with the full circle kind of stuff, you start with mated queens, maybe in your first couple packages or your nukes that you buy. I went from using largely Italians in Kentucky because that's all it really almost anybody had down there. A few years later, I got myself into a Kentucky queen sort of program, trying to breed a local queen. And we were messing around with different types of bees outside the Italians and carnies. We started with Russians and this and that down in there. And we were trying to breed from those bees. Um, this is years and years ago. Um, and that was my first exposure to things like Russian bees and all of this. I mean, I started with bright yellow, easy going bees from Georgia. I came to Iowa, still on that Italian bee kind of mind, mindset, and I do love Italians. And then for wintering, I was told John Johnson is the guy. Um, I don't know if you used to know him, but man, what a guy. Uh, he said, you should switch to carnies. Um, they'll just winter, darker bee, a little more acclimated to northern environment. They'll shut down their brood ring a little more. I think sometimes we make a bigger difference out of these different subspecies of bee than what actually exists. I think some of this is in our heads, at least at this point, I feel like we're really playing with mutts, possibly that just get sorted by color as much as anything else. But I switched over to carnies and kind of fell in love with them, carniolans. I get along with those bees really well. And then I started making my own queens, as I mentioned before. And then everything was kind of mudded out, but it was largely from carniolan stock that I was using almost exclusively up until that time. And I was just open mating them. And then you get all kinds of weird coloration. You kind of lose those traits, but they were good bees. I liked them. They were gentle enough. They're productive enough. I'm not making any big claims <laughs> about them, but I just got along with them. And I was using almost all my own queens there for a while. And then eventually got into this California run and you, you just end up with two sides to that. 
you want those stupid feedlot cattle kind of bees, to a certain extent anyway, that where if you give them a squirt of syrup in a pollen patty, that queen's gonna keep laying your eggs. Because to pollinate in the wintertime, you need a big cluster of bees. And the way to get to that, the easiest route, is to put in food and watch the hive grow another couple of frames or whatever, or at least maintain itself instead of folding in for the wintertime. So I got on Italians. And again, I get along with them just fine. I think they're beautiful bees. I think they do good. They're just gentle, sweet little lambs, almost too much so. Um, and I've used those for quite a while here. And, and while I like them, I make comparisons. And I just picked on Foley in a, in a loving way. <laughs> um, but one thing is for sure is that working his bees, I see the amount of feed and mite treatments that he puts into his Russian bees. Whether or not you get along with Russians is a different issue. But I see his input costs compared to mine, and we're close by each other, you know. He's Indianola and Des Moines. We're, we've got yards that are probably less than eight miles apart or whatever. We're, we're pretty much beekeeping neighbors, maybe 10. And so I know that he's getting his bees through to at least similar health conditions of mine, for good or for bad, on way less inputs than what I'm putting in there. And I think that's a noble thing, right? If, not just for pocketbook, but because the bees are just a little more sustainable and a little more resilient, a little cheaper to feed. They're responding to conditions a little bit better. And I'm not saying I want to switch to Russians, but I'm saying that maybe I've lost focus on some pretty critical pieces of the beekeeping puzzle by chasing that pollination cluster size, right? And so as time has gone by, I feel like maybe it's time to reintroduce queen rearing and I'm gonna be doing that. I bought a bunch of uh, mini nukes this year. I'm gonna fill those up and get back to playing around and kind of the artistry of beekeeping again. I'm really looking forward to that. So who knows? That's why that little question mark is there. Who knows what's coming next? But again, that's kind of a full circle plus some. That's like a, um, a, a roundabout and a half. And I feel like a lot of people go through this too. You start out, your options on a package are Italian or carny. Do you want a yellow one or a darker one? I don't know, give me whatever you got. You start with that, you like it or you don't. The grass is greener, I'm gonna try Saskatraz or I'm gonna try ankle biters. This kind of came and went, didn't they? Um, whatever other type of bee, Minnesota Hygienics, to name another real common one that's been around for a long time. You like things about them, you don't like things about them, you change, you try new things, and I think that's part of the fun of beekeeping. All right. Here's another one of those elements, is um, requeening. I won't ask for a show of hands, but I know that there's kind of a full spectrum of beekeepers that have never requeened a hive that has a lane queen in it to beekeepers that watch for certain signs of a queen going out. Oh, she's a couple years old. Or, oh, I'm seeing a spotty brood pattern, so I'll jump in and intervene. To beekeepers that never do that, to beekeepers that requeen every hive every spring, right? There's a few of those out there. And I question myself on this all the time. I'm not a requeener, unless there's a problem, right? But I'm splitting, splitting, splitting every year, this time of year, coming up real soon, <laughs> These queens are going to start flowing in. So the splits all get new queens, and I figure that's good enough. And um, then I run into people like, you know, this is Phil Westra. If you haven't met him or heard him talk and you ever get an opportunity, don't pass it up. Uh, he's way up there and uh, almost as far into the northwest Iowa area as you can possibly get. And um, this is one of his bee yards. And do you see these alcohol wash jars? How many of you have an alcohol wash jar? I've got one. Anybody have more than one? <laughs> Look at that collection, and that's not even the whole collection. He literally has one of those for every hive. And so you can see they're all numbered, you know, on there. And he keeps a log, which eventually turns into a spreadsheet of just every detail as he follows these, these bees. And if that alcohol wash comes in at over a certain threshold, which is low, that hive gets requeened with a hive that he hopes, and he, with a new queen that's from a lineage that he hopes won't brew itself up to those. And so he's breeding and making queen cells and he's coming off and checking those queen cells for probably a whole variety of different qualities that he's after, but mite control being a huge one, right? And what would be better than having your own bees of your own stock that are productive, gentle to work with, make you a good honey crop, survive the winter and can deal with mites maybe no, no, no bee is perfect in that regard, but can deal with mites far better than anything you can buy commercially. And that's his quest that he's on. And I hope that 
that things continue to go well. I will say that he is as diligent and hardworking at this as anyone I've ever met, and I think it's so cool that he is in our state. <laughs> and uh, man, I have optimism for him. The notion of this is that if you're not requeening, even if you have hive selected, that you want to fo- <laughs> that you want to follow. If your other bees are getting overrun by varroa mites, then eventually so will your good hives, right? Because it's not reasonable to think that there's this bee that can just handle this just pounding of uh, mite bombing, just like a wall of mites, just like or a wave of them coming at this hive. But if you can keep mites low and suppressed across your yard in any of the colonies that are exceeding your threshold, if you can maybe come in and treat those or move them out of the yard when that's discovered, requeen them with good queens, follow that into the future. If you can keep the hives that you're following the genetics of with a reasonably low mite threshold without treating them on your own, but keeping them from being bombed by outside hives, then you really know what you're looking at. And that's what he's trying to do with these. Requeening is somewhere where I'm at right now. It's something I've never done in through, you know, 20 whatever years I've been at this. I think that this might be a season where everything gets a new queen, and we'll just see if that doesn't improve things. And what I'm really looking for on that isn't any miracles. What I'm looking for is less of that attrition come fall, because I had a lot of that last year, Um, where you just go to your yard, where you pulled a honey crop off of pretty much all the hives in there, and you come back and some of them are thriving and other ones aren't. And then you maybe do a combine in that weak hive and a decent hive that you put together now is weak again, right? We've probably experienced this. I know I've <laughs> been through this year after year after year. And I just wonder if part of that is an aging queens and queens that aren't up to what I want them to be. I wanna fix that this year if I can possibly do it here. That's my goal for this year. Next year I'll say, I didn't do it. We'll try again this year. <laughs> All right. Feed, there's my dead son after lifting about six of these bags with me. <laughs> He weighs exactly 100 pounds, and these are 50-pound bags of sugar, so I'm not going to ride him too hard for feeling like uh, he's going to die on there. He did eventually get back up. He's fine. All right. Um, I've gone from honey is the best bee food. You hear that a lot, or at least you used to hear that a lot. Honey is the best food for bees is something that people have said, I think, since the beginning of time. And it's hard to argue, but a heavy hive is better than a light hive. And some of our late nectars that we get, asters is one I always look at, and I'm always thankful for a good fall flow, but I also know it comes with some issues, dysentery being one. I think there's a lot of indigestibles in some of these later season dark nectars, particularly asters, I believe, that can kind of mess up a bee's gut, right? And so I'm always happy when hives get reasonably heavy on late fall flow because it means that I feed less, and of course nectar is good for bees. I'm I'm certainly not negating that tonight. But I went from that moving around honey frames from hive to hive, trying to equalize things and get them heavy, moved to feeding a lot of sugar water. And then from there, you discover corn syrup. And once upon a time, corn syrup used to be quite a bit cheaper than buying sugar. That fluctuates, you know, through time, just like diesel used to be cheaper than than gasoline. Now look. Um, So I moved primarily over to high fructose corn syrup, HFCS, um, both for the convenience of not having to mix sugar, right? And also the price and just the convenience of it all is just amazing, just mind blowing. Oh, wow, I've just discovered something good. And then you watch a video or you, you, Bob Benny came to the honey producers and he's got a video about this uh, as well. And he kind of picks on corn syrup a little bit, not saying that it's evil, not pointing anything bad about it necessarily, but in a comparison and contrast to sugar syrup, sucrose, um, there's a lot going on in these bees that, you know, we're, we're kind of to a point where we understand it. If you're into that kind of stuff, and a lot of us are clueless about it all. And he talked, did any of you see him when he talked at the honey producer meeting is absolutely fascinating. This is just a couple of years ago. He talked about how feeding a dilute sucrose, regular sugar water mixture stimulates the bees to use it very differently than the way that they'll store corn syrup in a hive. Corn syrup gets bees good and heavy. It gives them calories. If that's what you're looking for, if you got that light hive going into winter, there ain't anything wrong with corn syrup. I'm convinced of that. I see a lot of really good bees that get fed nothing but corn syrup outside of what nature provides, of course. 
but especially maybe for this time of year, that light sugar syrup gets placed into the brood nest and around the brood area, and your bees add their own little bits to this. Glucose oxidase, for example, is the enzyme they make. That glucose oxidase plus that light sucrose creates hydrogen peroxide. And the bees can put concentrations of this here and there. It's not uniform through the hive, it's near the brood nest where they want to increase our hygienic behavior. So we might be able to almost use feed as a way to stimulate hygienic behavior instead of just what we think of normally, or at least what I'm guilty of thinking of a lot, is using feed to stimulate brood rearing or get the hives heavy so they don't starve. There's a whole nother component to this that's kind of invisible to us that may be the most important uh, piece of this puzzle. But then when you learn that, <laughs> conveniently, corn syrup price is way up right now. So it's not just me being like, oh, spare no expense. <laughs> um, I got a good deal on sugar. I bought a couple pallets of sugar. We're set to go. Still, as I say that, I hope the season kicks in. I see a lot of dandelions, especially on southern facing slopes. I hope to not have to feed very much at all. Um, pollen sub is a similar thing. I used to have a lot of reservations about feeding pollen sub late into the year. Um, it just didn't seem like a good idea to knock the bees out of sync with the environment around them. Then I started taking bees to almonds and I thought, we're gonna do this. We want big bees, we want bees late. Also, you know, through these last decade, 15 years, there's been huge changes in what varroa mites do to bees. And that has changed my beekeeping a lot as well. I'd never had bees pre varroa of course, and that's, that goes back to late 80s, early 90s in Iowa. And uh, so I've never experienced that. But for years when I started with bees, I would think that eight, 10 mites at the end of the year was an acceptable threshold. And if I had that, that uh, ether roll is what I used to do a lot and still do sometimes, a, a way of sampling adult bees, and I would land on maybe eight mites in that jar, that hive would probably go through winter without a treatment, it'd probably do fine. Now, my threshold is 1%. If I do that roll, and I've got 300-ish bees in that roll, and I shake three mites or more, they're probably gonna get another something, right? Added to that to try and kill those mites. Maybe if they're down there and we're getting late in the season, that extra something might be oxalic vapor just to get those mites out of there as they go through winter, but they're gonna get something more because I feel like three and four mites are now doing as much damage as what eight and 10 mites used to do. And the difference isn't the mites, the difference I think is the virus loads that they're associated with and what those viruses are doing to our bees. And so pollen sub has become a critical issue for me. I try to get my honey off um, as early as I can, and sometimes that still isn't early enough. I try to get that stuff off at the end of August, going into September and be done with it. And as I'm leaving the yard with my honey supers on my truck and that big cloud of bees behind me, each one of those hives has a mite treatment in it as I leave. I don't even let the sun go down on those yards anymore. I don't leave the yard with my honey crop until the mite treatment's in the hive, the lids then go back on, then I get in the truck and take that honey where it needs to go. That's how critical I think mite control is. And it's something I still struggle with. Um, and part of that probably is the genetics of these sissy Italian bees that, that I love to run so much. They're susceptible, man. They need you for so much. They need you for feed. They need you for mite treatment. What you get in return is gentle little lambs that are productive and, and all that kind of stuff too and stay with big colonies through the winter, or so you hope. Um, but there's a price to pay for that, I think, and that's input costs. Pollen sub, what I feel like to get back to that is if you're fighting mites at the end of the year, there's a kill the mites component and then there's a time component to it, right? You wanna get cleaner and cleaner progressively bees and then take those bees into winter, right? If you kill mites in November, you can have zero counts in your hives, but you still have hives that are going into winter sick, right? Because they were infested with those mites during their pupation stage and they're in trouble, right? So you've killed the mites, but you still have all the problems. Now you take those sick bees in the winter and you don't see them again in spring. So, you know, it's a common kind of advice is to get the mites out early enough in the season so that you get a couple few more generations of bees, right? And with every brood cycle, you're getting 
in, in theory, healthier and healthier, right? The mites are gone. So that next generation of bees is gonna be bred up with mites all over them during their pupation stage. But they're still being nursed by sick older sisters, right? So then that next generation is finally, now we're two generations removed from your mite kill. Now you've got healthier bees developing with healthier parents, and you're gonna take those into winter, you know, two and three steps removed from your mite uh, issue. And the way to get to that some years requires a lot of stimulation, which is in feeding both sugar syrup and pollen sub, I feel like really, you put that in there. Jamie Ellis argued this at our last meeting, and I have a lot of respect for him. I hate to negate anything he says, but that's the problem with anecdotal evidence, right? We see it happening in our hives, and so we say, I don't care what the scientist says, <laughs> and we'll see who's right in the long run. But when I put pollen sub and syrup into a hive in the fall, I swear in those hives, I will see eggs and brood continuing later than if they didn't get those inputs, and that's what I'm after. Sometimes with pollen sub, it's not even nutrition, it's stimulation. All right just changes through the years. Splitting is another one of those. Um, California has part of this, but I think even if I wasn't doing the migratory thing, I don't know that that would affect anything. I think one, uh, one practice that a lot of beekeepers just never really do to the fullest potential is splitting. You know, you have, I'm not gonna ask for a show of hands, but there's, there could be a beekeeper in here that's never split hive. You come through winter, you have your bees, you build up, you put a super on, and then a while later you see a swarm hanging from a tree somewhere. <laughs> and you think, well, I put that super on there, why they swarm anyway? And that's because that's what bees do. <laughs> um, all the reproduction, all the egg laying, everything that's going on inside that colony is almost more like cell division within our bodies, right? If you think of it that, in that big picture sort of way, it's almost as if the only actual reproduction making a new organism, superorganism, whatever you call it, is swarming, right? Where the old queen leaves with about half your bees, the provisions for a new queen are there, time rolls her out, eventually she'll get mated, start laying, and now you have two hives made from one. That's what we think of as reproduction, right? You make another person, you make another turkey, <laughs> whatever it is. In the bee world, it's not, I made more bees in the same colony, still with only one mom, in there, it's make a new swarm, make a new colony and cast that thing out. And bees do this when there's a lot of brood pheromone, maybe there's a waning queen pheromone, there's a lot of food coming in the door, they made it through winter, there's all kinds of like little, little check boxes. When those things get crossed off, queen cells are made, now goes the swarm. To avoid that, a lot of beekeepers think, well, I know I need to split my hive when it comes through winter. There's been a lot of communication about uh, splitting and swarming and all this on Facebook already, which is great, right? People are realizing I've got strong hives coming through this mild winter. It's early. I got a lot of brood. I need to do something good. Splitting that double that's come through and both boxes relatively filled with bees is not enough if you just knock that in half. Um, it, it, maybe even three uh, splits off of that. The parent and two splits may or may not even be enough. I think that, that that's something that in recent years I have really ramped up. And uh, maybe that's greed. <laughs> maybe it's trying to be more sustainable in my beekeeping. But I think the way to lose less swarms and spend less money on buying bees is to take the resources that you have and split them instead of letting nature do that because that's eventually what they're gonna do on their own. And so in recent years, get that parent colony and if it's a good one, I'm going to shake a package of bees out of it. And shaking bees is something that I'm relatively new to just in the last couple of years. It's really fun and it's very profitable. That's a good combo. <laughs> um, if you can shake three pounds of bees out of a hive or anywhere close to that, you know, we're shaking frames into kind of a a bulk box and then making up three pound packages. But I mean, if you're shaking several frames out of a hive, you're getting close to three pounds of bees that are coming out of that one parent hive. You put that box back on and then come back in a little bit and now maybe make a nuke out of that. And you've really taken some swarm urge out of that. Sometimes you can come back a while later 
and the frames now are drawn that you might have put in there as foundation after you robbed a, a five frame nuke out of there, maybe three frames of brood and a couple other frames. And you created that nuke, you've already shaken a package of bees, you still have that parent that's going gangbusters, do it again. Now you're getting somewhere. And again, a hobby is there to cost you money. And that's part of this progression or things I've learned or things I have to learn over again or things I think I've learned, but then eventually I end up going back to what I used to do. It's just more and more and more splitting. And if you push it, at least for me, what I've realized is that you still end up with a good bunch of bees that mostly stay home where you want them and don't end up swarming. And you still, time is on your side in Iowa, can make a good honey crop of it. Because a lot of times I think we're a little hesitant to split so hard because we don't want to cut into our honey crop. And there is a reality to that. But I think the amount that we can split and the resources that we can take from these big booming parent colonies and split those out is a really good way to get cash in hand if you are trying to make this into a small business. Um, it's really nice to have that money coming in in spring because springtime could be expensive. Buying queens, buying new equipment, all the feed sometimes that's necessary adds up big time. It doesn't even take a lot of bees and you've got quite a bill. Well, if you can sell that package or sell that nuke, then you got money coming in and there's a lot of profit to be made. And what's better than buying local and supporting people around you versus buying something off the internet that, from people that you don't know. So I can do nothing but encourage people, get your bees through winter, that's easier said than done obviously, and split the hell out of them. And when you do that, you can make increases for yourself, you can make up for your losses, and hopefully then you even have bees left over to sell to your friends and neighbors. And I think that's just, uh, that's where you start to get somewhere in terms of making a profit with your bees and becoming more sustainable. All right, honey harvest and extraction. I already mentioned this one in terms of there's always something to buy. <laughs> and the more bees you have, the more expensive those toys get. Um, this is uh, from uh, early 80s gleanings of bee culture. Um, and I just randomly saw this in a stack of them in my office recently, and I'd never even looked at it, but even the cover article is every uncapper. And there's another one that uh, was every extractor, I think. Anyway, there's like a little series they did. Just here's what's on the market right now. And it's crazy when you look through these things and think I've done that, I've done that, I've done that. So you start off with a bread knife. Wow, that's for the birds, right? And then you get that hot knife. Ooh, that Pierce hot knife. Plug that thing in, let it get good and hot. Ooh, that's nice. Then you end up with almost carpal tunnel. Um, <laughs> and you just, and that's the pinch point for me. It's always torture, torture, torture until you're cussing and you're just broke down and then you spend the money on it, right? And then you would think, I don't know if I wanna spend this money. Oh God, I hope this is a good thing to spend this money on. And then you get it and you're like, why in the world didn't I do that three years ago, right? That's my life right there. And so I've gone from the bread knife to the electric knife. And I did that for a lot of bees right there. I mean, I've processed untold amounts of honey using a hot knife. Riley's shaking his head back there too. And it works and it works pretty good, but then your wrist about falls off at the end of it. And you think, man, this is slow and miserable. Then I got that Kelly's wiggle knife. And that thing I almost cut my middle finger off with. <laughs> a serrated electric hot knife that's on a cam on a motor. So it's just vibrating like this in front of you. And then you take those honey frames and run it like this. And all I did was drop a capping fork on the back side of the, of, the, of the trough, like the uncapping kind of station that I was using. And I went to reach for it and I caught my finger on that and it just went to the bone. And that's one of those, uh-oh, <laughs> kind of moments. And you just get a bunch of paper towel and a bunch of electrical tape and then you just keep extracting. And so I sold that not too long after that. And I picked up the Max Ant kind of pop-up toaster is what I always call it. Man Lake makes one too, right? And I thought, I've arrived. I've got my Max Ant one frame. It's a chain flail uncapper. It uncaps both sides at the same time. And you don't have to use a hot knife. And you just have a little lever and it forces the frame down in between and back up, uncapped. Put that in the uncapping tank while the extractor's running. I had a 33 frame extractor and I just thought I have, I've made it. I'm the big time. I got a 33 frame extractor and I got an uncapper where I don't have to use a hot knife. I got a little pump that'll pump it up into a holding tank. This is it, I'm set. <laughs> and then eventually more equipment, more equipment. Now I've got a, a Gunnis. 
I've got a couple big reels. I've got a, a wax extruder, you know, one of the Lyson things. I've got pumps, I've got sumps, I've got this and that. And uh, there's just no end to it all. And so every uncapper I thought was a funny title for this article is because is that just supposed to be options or is that the, the treadmill that we're on where we start with the bread knife and end up at the Gunness or the Cowan line? You know, there's always another uh, fancier one out there for sure. All right. Here's a picture of Tyler and I extracting. This is his old Cowan. See that pile of frames on the end there? That's the problem that I solved this year by buying the Gunness. The Cowan is nice, it's fast, he's in love with it. I wanna throw it in the river. I hate a Cowan um, because they're fiddly and I just wanna turn off my brain and slap frames down as fast as you can slap them down. It's a conveyor belt. It's got chain flails on the bottom and top, uncaps both as fast as you can throw them down there. And you don't end up with that huge pile of trash frames like you do with a cow. And so we're moving to that. All right. Honey handling. <laughs> this is another one. I totally remember thinking that a five gallon pail of honey was just an ungodly amount of honey, right? And we've all had that experience, right? Um, I love to see those pictures on Facebook on the beekeeping pages every fall or late summer where the new beekeeper, if you've done this in this room, we've all done it. You get that honey and you let it settle in your little five gallon pail with a little uh, valve or whatever on the bottom. You let that settle and ooh, that looks good. And you get your jars and you bottle up every single pound of honey that you made in jars and you set them on your table and you take that picture and share it on the internet. And then a month later, it's all crystallized because you stored it in your basement or whatever, you know, some cool corner of your house. And now you got all these jars of crystallized honey that now you don't know how you're gonna, you know, liquefy again and all that goes on. Then it became, I'll just store it in five gallon pails, warm those up, bottle as necessary. That was life changing. Um, so much simpler to just warm up one batch of honey, basically as much as you think you can sell before it crystallizes, starts to get cloudy or whatever, push that out the door, then liquefy more. And that basically is still what we do. But I got to the point where I was carrying over 160 pound pails down my old basement steps, just waiting for the day in my old house that one of those steps was gonna go with my couple hundred pounds plus carrying two pails. So that's, that's 400 pounds going down each one of those old rickety steps. And I was storing all this honey on pallets, but just stacked pails down there. Then we had that big flood and we got four feet of water in our basement. And that was just a nightmare, right? That was my whole honey crop. I had tons and tons of honey left. Luckily, that was about the leanest point in the summer when we got that. I'd sold everything down over the winter. I just thought I gotta stop selling this stuff out of my basement, right? It's all getting extracted in my garage back then, carried in, carried down, and then of course carried back up to liquefy and sell. That became a total nightmare. But again, I did it way longer than what any sane person would. And then you just think, well, I know what the solution is. I'll move to drums, <laughs> simple. But then all of a sudden you've got a 679 pound drum hanging there. The weight of the drums included in that. It's not teared out. Drums, 38 pounds or so, something like that. Essentially 645, 650 pounds. It seems like I never hit that 650, um, but a full, 55 gallon uh, drum is something that you can't just pick up and carry two at a time down your basement stairs. So then you need a special drum dolly. Maybe you need a forklift. You need some way to move these things around. Then you got a drum. It's like, okay, I can move the thing. How the hell do I liquefy a drum? Liquefying a five gallon bucket or some honey jars in an old fridge with a light bulb or something like that was pretty simple. What do you do with a drum? <laughs> so then you're on either band heaters or you're creating a little styrofoam box now so that you can put that thing in there and set it down and put some slow, gentle heat on there. Maybe give it a stir every now and then and let that thing come up. And that's kind of still where I'm at. Even though I know there's better ways, this is working pretty well. Um, but every piece of that, in a drum is a different beast and it's way more and way more expensive and uh, way more of a learning curve to having the right equipment to, to move drums, just to handle them, to stack them, what you're gonna do with them, to move them from your shop to your house, to liquefy them. There's a lot to this, right? And so we just think, well, it's just a bigger container until you realize I can't pick this thing up anymore. Um, that kind of thing. And so there's always a learning curve. There's always that weak spot. And I think that a lot of us are in there for whatever level. You start with 
two hives in your backyard. You don't have to drive anywhere. Brand new equipment, maybe a two or a four frame hand crank extractor. And that's, that's the sweet spot. <laughs> so the, the point of this talk is don't overgrow yourself, <laughs> right? No, I'm just kidding. But um, there is something to say for that simplicity. When extracting your honey is like one of the greatest days of the year. I remember those days. Now I hate it. <laughs> um, I love beekeeping. And plus, I worked myself into a corner. I have no other skills whatsoever. So I better try to keep that mentality where I enjoy this. It was a treat the last couple of days, finally getting my bees back and actually working and then working some more uh, on my own stuff finally has just been a real joy. But uh, so it's not all bad, right? But that honey extraction, you know, you, you go from almost like a party, maybe invite someone over, maybe get your spouse involved. My wife has never even been to my shop. <laughs> um, that's how we stay married, I think. <laughs> she does a lot for our little family business, that's for sure. She does a lot of liquefying. She does almost all the bottling. She does all the beeswax handling and filtering and makes candles and this and that and does all the market prep that we do and delivers and all kinds of stuff. She does all of our invoicing. But if you ask her to drive to our bee yards, I bet there's one or two that she knows where they're at and the rest she doesn't even know. And she's never been inside the shop and probably that's a good thing. <laughs> but um, all of that to say, there's always that pinch point, right? If you're just the tiny backyard beekeeper, there's a whole catalog full of stuff for you. And then all the way up until you're a huge scale commercial beekeeper, there's always a pinch point. It's like, if I had this, then life would be so sweet. And then you get that and then you just realize, if I just had this, then you know it's like whatever efficiency you gain, then you realize the next pinch point, and then you realize the next. And if there's an end to that battle on a sideline scale, I would love to find it. <laughs> I'm on a quest, I don't know if I'll ever find it. All right, wax handling is another perfect example of that, right? Getting about a pound of bees. Well, I don't know if you guys have ever added this up per 80, maybe 100 pounds of honey, and you end up with about a pound of beeswax. Of course, this varies on what you're uncapping, how many frames you have in each super, you know, how much comb you're cutting off, all that wax rendering. But my God, is that ever a perfect example of that pinch point, right? It's like, okay, I've got an extraction line. And look, there's time, and then there's a reward at the end of that, right? Money because it's easy to sell your honey as a generality. And if you can make a good honey crop, get it extracted efficiently, boom, it's there. Wax handling stuff is ridiculously expensive. Wax is okay price per pound, but it sure takes a lot of work to get to that rendered beeswax one pound block or that candle or whatever compared to honey, right? Where you just extract that. And a point of pride is that the honey is exactly the same as the bees have made it. And I didn't do anything to it, right? As it should be. Wax is not that way. <laughs> Wax, as you get it, is dirty cappings and it's gotta be melted down. And then it's gotta be filtered and filtered again and rendered out and molds and this and that and clutter and whatever. And it's sticky and it's dirty and it's messy and it leaves a trail, right? And every piece of it is ridiculously expensive to try and gain those efficiencies. And unlike honey extraction equipment and beehives and things like that that we spend money on, it seems like with wax, in my mind, a lot of times the money that I spend on wax handling is because I hate waste. And so I spend money to become less wasteful of that resource beeswax and sometimes the decision on spending money for wax rendering and wax handling stuff isn't even so much, this will make me more profitable because I don't know that I'm ever gonna recover the amount of money that I've spent on wax handling stuff, but it's that I'm not wasting it. And instead my wife can take that wax and turn it into ridiculously beautiful things, right? Which we have as a point of pride as we sell those. But in terms of recouping the investment on wax handling stuff, I'm not so sure. So this is my current uh, wax setup is a licensed cappings press, which I've uh, modified <laughs> greatly. Uh, I cut the bottom of that off with a plasma cutter and then Tyler Holton welded um, more legs to it to get it to stand up again. I can't weld stainless steel, save my life. And then I put that little um, 
uh, sump tank underneath there to catch. That was a pinch point. It was overflowing itself. The extruder could keep pace with the extraction line. As it drips the honey coming through that press, that was a slow spot. And so we put a bigger tank underneath there and solve that. Those are expensive. The pumps to get it there are expensive. Now you've got all these little curly cues of wax. What do you do with those? Well, you need to melt them down. So now we got drums between me and Tyler's crop. We got drum, 55 gallon barrels of this compressed wax stuff and no reasonable way to melt those down. For years, I did it in a beer keg that I cut the top of it off and I put that beer keg, um, put a little water in the bottom of it, put it on a turkey fryer and put cappings into that. I did that for a long time. I had a little ball valve that I drilled a hole inside the beer keg and I would try to put the water level up to that ball valve just slightly higher and then I would melt the cappings in there. Horribly dangerous. I can't believe I never burnt my house down doing this in a driveway. And, uh, <laughs> and, and, and it works, right? And you can get reasonably decent cappings melted down, all of that, but it sure is time consuming. With this, I bought this old, ancient uh, Cook and Beals wax melter there. Belabored myself over whether or not to spend the money on this old thing. It was broken when I bought it. it. Took me a year before I finally got around to fixing it up. That thing has been a joy. It smells good when it's cooking in there, and you start. You can fill that. That thing holds a drum of cappings at a time, and I uh, tip that drum over top there. It melts those down. It has one auger that runs sideways and it pushes those cappings, compressing them, beeswax comes out, all the slum gets compressed, and then it has another auger that's this box on this side that pulls them up, and so you get your slum separated from your wax, in theory, separated from your melter honey. That melter honey's way too burned for me to ever sell. But man, the first time that finally got that thing working and saw that yellow wax coming out that valve at the bottom, I was like, yes! Like, it's so rewarding when you get to that spot. And look at this, like the, the point of these things is to say, this ain't fancy. Expensive and fancy are two different things. <laughs> and you can go way more expensive on either one of these. These were both used pieces of equipment that I bought. But that little tiny nubbin at the bottom that's going out into this secondary melter there is where the wax flows out. And that first little trickle of wax was the most rewarding experience I've had in a, probably a year of beekeeping. You can see the speakers kick on the tunes, possibly grab a beer and watch that wax flow. Don't leave it unattended and burn your shop down. All right, markets, this is another thing. Through time, you do things and then you come back to them and you do different things and you try different things and maybe what works at one market doesn't work at another. And so it's constant experimenting, right? And I've been talking about beeswax, there's my wife's wax, something that we're pretty proud of. Um, that's a, a, a drawing of a honey bear that my son did when he was, I don't know, four maybe. And we blew it up and then he helped me cut it with a little handheld jigsaw out of plywood. If you can't tell those letters are a little shaky on there. I love those shaky letters. He did that, <laughs> that kind of thing. Um, so that gets set up at our markets. Um, I, we're MBS honey, Meadow Blazing Star honey. And I always say MBS is DIY. We are very do it yourself. Um, the honey that you see in those bottles is our own honey. That's a point of pride. Um, anything on that table from the wooden spoons to the beeswax goods, all of that is made by my wife, that kind of stuff. So markets, again, that first, you know, 60 pound pail of honey, that was the entirety of my two hive crop there that first year or second year or whatever, just seemed like such an enormous amount of honey. And now, you can see all the different sizes of jars that we sell, this and that on that table. Um, things definitely change through time, right? Uh, hopefully head in a good way. The honey price is in the toilet. If you're trying to sell honey on a big scale, drums of honey, good luck making a profit with that. It can be done, but my God, it takes a lot of honey to get a little bit of money if you're selling bulk honey like that, right? But we all know that if you take that same honey, keep it nice and liquid, filter it so it's nice and bright and shiny in the sun and you put a nice label on it and you put it in jars and it looks good and you're there face to face with your customer. If you put all that time and energy and effort and expense of jars and this and that and your time that it takes to put all that together and then you got to haul it to the market and you got to stand there for a couple hours a week at each market that you do. Now you're getting somewhere. 
but you sure are putting a whole lot more effort into that pound of honey than if it was just in a drum that you were putting out on somebody else's truck with a forklift, right? I'd love to see the honey price go way up. <laughs> I think, you know, 10 bucks a pound is a pretty good price in the jar. That's what we're charging now. Uh, and I know that varies market to market, city to city, whatever. We're in Des Moines, so maybe that's a little higher than some other places in Iowa. Um, every now and then you get a customer that complains, that's too much. <laughs> and it's just like, then it ain't for you. <laughs> Walmart exists, and, and that is that, right? Not to be too sassy, but I'm here to say my back tells you it isn't too much. So I guess that's it on markets. It's like, it's hard to figure out what's going to sell and what's not. We take a lot of beeswax to markets knowing that it's not really gonna sell. People don't buy a lot of beeswax and candles in the middle of summer, but they do buy a lot of beeswax and candles and things like that in the fall. Thanksgiving to Christmas to that kind of stuff is huge. And so I feel like putting a little of that onto a table all summer long, because we're in our neighborhood, is worthwhile even if I don't sell very much of it to the people that are there that day. If they see us again at you know, uh, uh, a market that's at a county park or whatever, you know, we do all that kind of stuff, you know, different craft shows or whatever in the fall. Hopefully they're going to make that connection and know, oh, this guy's from our neighborhood. I recognize him or that's something about, you know, I, I recognize that ugly <laughs> face or whatever that's behind the table. I, I've seen him before or whatever, um, or my sweet wife or whatever the connection is. And, and then maybe that's when you'll get it. And so we like to put it out in front of people's faces all year long. All right. And then honey sales again, um, kind of covered this getting ahead of myself into markets, but um, there's a learning curve with this too. This is the biggest honey sale I ever made in terms of uh, a once and done sale. This is over four drums of honey, 48 pails, 60 pounds a piece. And um, I sold these, um, I got a call uh, like right at Christmas break. And I, all I wanted was time off with my family because I work full-time job and I'm running all these bees haven't had a vacation in 17 years, <laughs> other than visiting family or whatever. And I wanted that little break time. I was really looking forward to it. I knew I was gonna be in California pretty soon. And I got this call uh, from a meadery over in Davenport and um, I was stoked. Even though I didn't wanna be working, <laughs> I couldn't say no. And I scrambled and I delivered this order about a week later and uh, on uh, January 2nd or whatever. And here's the thing is I still haven't been paid. And so honey sales are tricky, right? And it's that same issue with everything else. You always are that little fish in the big pool. And you just, you're proud of what you have. And uh, you want it to be respected because you know how much work went into that. And you get so excited to make a big honey sale and you just think, holy smokes. And you know, hopefully this will work out through time or whatever, but there's always that little thing there. Cash in hand is a big one. And so in terms of learning lessons <laughs> and all of this, just because you invoice someone for over 10,000 bucks doesn't mean you're gonna get paid that $10,000. And be careful as we're small business people, if your business, if your hobby, whatever, you know, everything scales up. If I was a commercial beekeeper, they wouldn't be so stoked <laughs> about a little honey sale. But I went from being as excited as I have ever been over an, one individual sale um, to it's been a couple hard months <laughs> trying to deal with late payment, no payment kind of BS. And, uh, and that's a reality that we all may face as well, right? And so not to like, I'm almost done with this, not to end on a sour note because the flip side of this coin is that I've been selling honey for over 20 years and I've had slow payments, but I've never had one not come through. And hopefully this will be in that class. We'll find out over time. But there's, I think maybe you'll agree with this. There's almost nothing better, right? Because we're all obsessed with our bees and you just get that point of pride with your honey, with your beeswax, whatever it is that you're selling, where we're in a sweet spot too, where we're making I'm biased, but I feel like Iowa honey is just about the best honey that you're gonna find, right? There's places you can find lighter color honey. There's places where you can find sourwood honey or citrus blossom or whatever, special varietals that we don't have. But if you just wanna talk about regular wildflower honey, what nature produces, I've made honey in Ohio, Kentucky, Iowa, wherever, 
we make something special here. <laughs> like whether or not we realize it even as beekeepers, our honey is damn good. If you compare honey here or there, a lot of us, when we go on vacations, when we do whatever, you got to sample the honey wherever you are. Have you ever sampled honey and thought, man, I wish our honey tasted like that? Right. Why don't we brag that up better, right? So we, this honey sale part of it is that point of pride where even if you're on a, a hobby level beekeeping with a couple hives in your backyard and you have no intention of ever even having them really pay for themselves, there's just nothing maybe better than giving away that jar of honey or selling that jar of honey in knowing that when the person tastes that honey, they're gonna be pretty impressed with it, right? I didn't like honey when I was a kid because all I'd had was crappy store shelf honey, right? Um, and that's not a slam on anything or anyone. It's just the reality that there's a huge difference between what we're producing and the, the, the junk that's on store shelves. That's been heated, that's been ultra filtered, that's been this and that, that's been blended down into the point where it just doesn't really taste like anything. If you ever wanna take a bite of something you just can't even swallow, get a honey sauce packet from a KFC or whatever. You'll put that in your mouth after having your own honey and being spoiled and you, I, I tried it, it's been several years and I will not try it again. I couldn't swallow it. It was like a, a physical muscle motor kind of reaction. It, it, it's not food. I don't know what it is, but <laughs> we are so spoiled with the honey that, that we make that at least in, in my, you know, worm brain or whatever, it was a shock. It was like, I knew this would be bad, but I didn't know it was gonna be like this, right? So take pride in what you're doing, do as good of a job as you possibly can. And, and that is what we're doing. That's what pretty much every beekeeper does. And I think that's something that's really, really cool. And then just be too dumb to quit. <laughs> and picture my son, which doesn't mean he's dumb, but this is a shirt that Foley made, because I picked on Foley before, and I, I did that again to say uh, lovingly is uh, maybe me just being cheesy or whatever, but um, he has become a really good friend of mine over the years. He's a very generous guy, and I pick on him because of his equipment and this and that, but also I do that with very selected photos um, and beekeeping practices because I know he can handle it and because he's not a bad beekeeper. He's a good beekeeper. He does a great job in a lot of ways. He made this shirt 5-H because my son's name is Harlan, so we joke and call it Harlan's Honey. Then you've got Hol Holton's, Holton Homestead, and you've got Honey Hollow, that's Jason's business. And now there's a Hain Haynes Homestead that's uh, just outside Des Moines, kind of towards St. Charles. And they're selling mead and uh, a bunch of, you know, anything homestead related, honey and breads and all kinds of stuff like that. So there's all these H, 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 H. So he just said, let's just call it 5-H and be done with this <laughs> and stop competing against each other and work together. But if you look in the small print, it says too dumb to quit on there. And I feel like that could be my motto. So I guess I'll just leave it at that. If you have any questions over any of this, I guess we're, we're there. I've rambled enough. I thank you.